Hey everybody, my name is Scott Krostek. I am the, the pastor of Resurrection Downtown, and it's a great joy to be with you today. Thank you for being a part uh, of today's study on hope uh, with confident expectations. And uh, one of the things that I, I'm looking forward to is, is diving into this topic, but, but I want to dive into it specifically by focusing on one of our uh, paradoxes of the faith, one of the, the tensions that, that we live into, and, and that's that tension of the already and, and not yet. And my guess is you've experienced uh, the joy or the, or the tension associated with this already not yet paradox. Uh, it's this idea of, of being a part of something that has started that has yet to reach its full completion. Uh, my guess is you've experienced that in your own life, a, a project that you began that you had intended on completing so you could experience its joy and its fullness of completion, only to find yourself stuck somewhere in the middle between its beginning and its end. Now, I'm living in that reality right now. This season for me is a season where I am anticipating and, and looking forward to, to my, my daughter as she will grow and become the woman that God created her to be. Uh, but right now, uh, I am in the middle of, of, of life with a newborn, uh, which means for 40 weeks or so, we had been, been anticipating her arrival, this, this gift of new life. Uh, and, and as we are looking forward to that with great hope, we found ourselves uh, moving toward that, that moment of birth, labor, and delivery. And, and that happened just a little bit ago. We got to celebrate the birth of our, our first daughter. Uh, her name is Poppy. And, uh, and, and it's like when we got to that moment, when we got to meet her for the very first time, she was miraculous. She was beautiful. She was everything we'd been hoping for. And, and then reality set in. Because as overjoyed as we were with her coming into our life, uh, she wasn't able to express her own love and devotion toward us. She wasn't able to, to speak to us, to communicate with us. She wasn't able to, to respond to us. All she was looking forward to was eating and, and sleeping. And, and then, of course, having her diapers changed uh, all throughout the day and night. And so it's like we had this great gift that we were looking forward to, but yet it hasn't been fully realized. We haven't yet gotten to experience the, the fullness of that gift, uh, who she is, her personality, all the things that she's going to grow to become. And so we're living in this tension of something that has already happened that we were looking forward to that changes our whole lives, but we haven't yet fully experienced it in its fullness, in its completion. And, and this is the way it works with our life of faith as well. We live into this picture of the kingdom of God, which is already on one hand, something that has happened that has been born, and, and yet we're, we're waiting for it to arrive in its fullness. It's not yet capacity. And this is what we experience at Easter. On Easter, through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we get to experience the fullness of, of God's promise of, of a future filled with hope, this fullness of a, of a promise of eternal life, this gift of, of life overcoming death, of, 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 of this picture of light overcoming the darkness. We get to see all of this coming into full fruition, and we have this crazy hope on Easter. And yet during Easter, as we celebrate the resurrection and the life, uh, this already component to, to the kingdom of heaven, we're realizing that we're doing so while we face a reality that is very different. Just as we celebrate the resurrection and the life, we, we do so while facing the realities of today's day and age, which are finite. We still face things like suffering, like, like death, like illness, like disease, like, like poverty, like oppression, like marginalization. We still have these present-day realities that don't feel like the fullness of the kingdom of heaven. What do we do as people seeking to navigate the already not yet uh, component of, of our faith, this paradox of our faith and our life together? And what I've come to understand is that essential to, to paving the way for us during this season as we're looking to live as people of hope into the future that God has for us is that we need to understand worship fully. We need to gather together in, in worship regularly. Whenever we come together on worship weekends regularly, we come together to celebrate. We come together to remember God's power and God's presence. More specifically, God's uh, power as revealed in, in the resurrection. Uh, Easter is a day that we focus in on the resurrection. Easter is a day that we focus in on the power and presence of Jesus in the way that he overcame death. What I've come to know about weekly worship is that every time we gather together, it's a chance for us, regardless of what season it is, regardless of what we might be walking through, regardless of what we are facing currently in our present realities, every time we gather together for worship, we're actually called to have a mini resurrection celebration. Every time we gather together, not just on Easter, we have a chance to celebrate the power and presence of God, uh, to live fully as the people God created us to be emboldened uh, by his promise of resurrection power. And, and a love that won't let us go. And so when we gather together for worship, we find our strength and our hope, and we are filled with the assurance of God's steadfast love so that we can recognize 
that we have the power to overcome whatever it is that stands in our way, to shed free from whatever uh, shackles or or fetters are holding us back, to overcome whatever adversity uh, stands in our way. Worship becomes a fundamental rhythm uh, to our life together in that it gives us strength to carry forward, to press on, to persevere. It's a chance for us to remember uh, the power and presence of God in an unmistakable way to celebrate it so that we might live differently because of it. What I love about Easter and, and, the, and the power and the promise of the resurrection is that it gives us the ability to, to recognize something about God's love for us in the way that we're called to live fully. Uh, I think about it as being a source of, of our strength. I think about it as being a, a, a primary uh, piece of bread nourishing us for the journey ahead. When I think about the confidence that this instills within us, regardless of what we are facing, uh, I think about the words that Paul writes to the church at Rome. And there he's trying to encourage his community to overcome his present and their present reality. And as he urges them, he asks them a question in light of their understanding of the power and presence of God, the hope of the resurrection. And this is what he writes to that church uh, in the eighth chapter of his letter to the church at Rome. He says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him uh, who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we gather together for worship, what we're ultimately recognizing is that God has given us this power and this power has made it possible so that nothing can separate us from the assurance of God's steadfast love. Nothing can separate us from God's power and presence. And therefore, what we ought to be able to do is to live differently. And so the question is, how is it that we're called to live? And this Jesus instructs us and he informs us and he he gives us a picture for what that looks like, but not before fully revealing himself to us. And and, and to this end, I like to look at at, at different passages of Scripture to give us patterns for how it is that worship should affect us and change us. And one of the first places I look is not to the Gospels, but to the book of Isaiah. And and here the prophet of God, he begins to, to create for us what worship should look like and feel like for us as we gather together weekly, drawing strength from God's power and God's presence. Here in Isaiah, the sixth chapter, the prophet begins to share this picture. And this is what he shares. He says this, I saw the Lord high and exalted. Seated on a throne, and the train of his robe, it filled the temple. Above him were a seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds they shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. This is a powerful picture of worship, because in it, the, the, the prophet, he, he shares this picture of, of, of himself entering into a room, and when he enters into the room, God's power and God's presence, it was overwhelming, so much so that, that God's bigness uh, meant that only the hem of his robe could be present in that room. He was so big that just a portion of his clothing uh, was present and palpable. And that was big enough to to overwhelm the prophet. And then the prophet was overwhelmed by singing of angels and and their voices beckoning back and forth, offering this word of praise, shook the foundations of the temple, and it forced this, this prophet to fall to his knees. Which means worship, as we gather together for worship, should be so filled with opportunities to experience God's power and God's presence in unmistakable ways that it should change us. It should render us It should humble us. It should allow for us to fall to our knees because of its uh, palpable nature. And so the prophet, he falls to his knees, humbled before uh, God's power and God's presence in the context of worship through singing, through sight, through sound. And he finds himself falling. Because in worship, one of the things that we recognize is that this is a place for, for us to experience God and to remember that God is God and that we are not. And what that looks like for us is humbling ourselves to God's power and God's presence. And this is good news. This is something that we should do. This is something that we need to acknowledge. This is who we are and who God longs for us to be. God longs for us to recognize that that he is God and that we are not. And and that we are called to humble ourselves before God because the first thing that that Isaiah does when he falls to his knees before God, he says, I'm a man of unclean lips, which means I'm finite. I I have failures. I have faults. I'm, I'm not worthy to be in the presence of this big and powerful divine presence. 
And yet what we're called to do when we humble ourselves in worship because of our encounter with the living God is that we're called to remember also that God loves us and longs for us to acknowledge his presence, longs for us to acknowledge our our confession, our failures, our, our finite disposition. God longs to hear our cries of confession and repentance. And this is one of the things I love about worship as well, and it's contained in the Psalms. This is what the psalmist sings. He says, Come and let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before our, our Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and, and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. The ancient Greeks, they had a word for worship, and, it, and it's written as proskuneo, and it talks about bowing down before God. And when we bow down before God, when we confess our sins, our failures, our faults, our finite capacity, What we recognize is that we are bowing down before the creator of all the universe. And he longs to be our shepherd. He longs to care for us, to hear from us, to lead us, to to comfort us, to, to love us, to be with us, to redeem us, even in death, so that we might share in the splendor of eternal life, to live in the promise of the resurrection. Worship is something that we do. It's something that we're called to live into daily so that we can experience God's power and God's presence, so that we can be assured of his steadfast love regardless of what we are facing, so that we can recognize that that God, our good shepherd, that Jesus, the resurrection, the life, who leads us even through valleys of darkness and death will redeem us, so much so that we have nothing to fear. God's perfect love, it, it, it casts out fear. And so when we fall to our knees in humble confession and worship, when we experience God in in liturgies and in psalms and in songs and in in prayers and in scripture and in sermon, we should be redeemed because of God's great love for us and recognize that we have the power by the resurrection of the body, by the resurrection hope that we experience at Easter to carry forward as as living uh, bodies of Christ. John, in in his letter, 1 John 4, he he says, Perfect love, it casts out fear, which means we are called as God's disciples to be fearless in our willingness to love others, to to let our light so shine, to go and do likewise, to become extensions, a living, living body of Christ, to be resurrection people. And so what that requires for us is, is to recognize that worship becomes the heartbeat of this. We go to worship to find strength and power and presence. We go to worship to find our hope in the resurrection to recognize that, that it's already happened, that, that Jesus has conquered the grave, that he has overcome death, that he has given us the ability to carry forward in the newness of life with him. But until we experience the fullness of God's kingdom, what we're called to do is to live like that, to love like that, to remember that God loves us and never leaves us, that there's nothing that could ever change that. And so through worship, we're called to experience that love, to remember that love, but more specifically to harness that love to be strengthened by that love, to carry forward each week as God's resurrection people, his ambassadors of light and life to the world around us so that others might come to know and experience the same power and presence of God and in turn experience worship, to recognize that God is God and that they are not and that because of that reality, we have hope, a hope filled with God's future of life, of love, and of the promise of the kingdom of heaven. I want to thank you for joining us this week, and and as you prepare for discussions, I want you to think about uh, what do you expect when you encounter worship? Uh, What are you looking for when you come and gather together for worship each week? The other thing I want to ask you to consider is is what do you expect will be the byproduct of worship every weekend? Uh, How do you expect to live a different kind of life, a changed life? And as you think about those things, I hope you have lively discussion, and I just want to thank you again for being a part of this study so that we might live together as people with confident hope. Uh, hope for a future filled with nothing but the life of Jesus Christ.